Okay, is that is that sharing for everyone? Yes. Uh, so uh, there is also a handout, and uh, I would encourage you to, to consult that as well, especially on bibliography, um, which I won't be listing here in my PowerPoint. Um, so uh, my talk is a little bit different from others. I'm talking less about an institutional subject that might have been inspired by Athens and more about uh, this sort of political cultural phenomenon of the demagogue. So we'll see uh, how it goes. So there's no doubt that demagogues populate the pages of our sources for Hellenistic history. Athenaeus quotes the rather odd author, Hegesander of Delphi, to the effect that the demagogues during the Cremonidian War flattered the Athenian demos in order to keep their spirits high. Uh, and I note here that Nino Laraghi has recently improved our understanding of this episode. For Plutarch, the demagogues of Teras were responsible for the decision to call in Pyrrhus of Epirus against the Romans. Uh, Polybius, and I'm sorry this is all untranslated, but uh, I will be translating more important passages later on where I do a close reading. Polybius mentions a demagogic politician of Chius, one Mulpagoras, who confiscated and redistributed uh, the property of the wealthy, and he blames the failed Achaean war on the demagoguery of Cretolaus and his faction. Diodorus Siculus says that the tyranny of Agathocles failed to end because of his ally, Danocrates, who did not want to give up his privileged position. And I quote, if he should return to Syracuse, it was altogether necessary that he should become a private citizen and be numbered one among the many, uh, seeing that autonomy loves equality. And in the elections, he might be surpassed by some chance demagogue since the majority is opposed to the preeminence of men who speak their minds. Uh, finally, although he does not use the word demagogue explicitly, the philosopher and historian Posidonius gives us a supremely unflattering portrait of the peripatetic philosopher Athenion, who stirred the Athenians to revolt against Rome during the Mithridatic War. Momiliano called it, quote, the most hostile image of a popular leader in Greek literature, unquote. And I note also that Ben Gray has addressed this episode recently. Examples can easily be multiplied. You'll note that while my list is bookended by Athenian episodes, this seems to be a Panhellenic phenomenon with occurrences from all around the Greek world in the fourth through first centuries BCE. Would it then be fair to speak of demagoguery in the terms that Henning Borm has recently applied to Hellenistic stasis, which he calls, quote, a fundamental principle of Greek thought, or at least a structural aspect of the polis that straddles the boundaries between major periods of Greek history. Here we are confronted by at least three problems. One is simply the question of what demagoguery is, whether it can be defined. In the modern world, demagoguery is one of those things where we know it as when we see it, as the phrase goes. But what about its ancient counterpart? Is it possible to pin it down or is it hopelessly subjective? Something used to slander one's political opponents. Uh, so for example, already Tarn and then Gruen have made influential arguments that Polybius's description of the lead up to the Achaean War is tendentious and cannot be called an instance of de demagoguery exacerbating class tensions within the Achaean League. I will re return to this problem in a moment. More important for our purposes are a further two questions about the classical Athenian democracy's effect on Hellenistic demagoguery. One is historiographical. The image of the demagogue was bequeathed to our Hellenistic sources by the classics of the fifth and fourth centuries, Aristophanes, Thucydides, Xenophon, and Aristotle, among others, almost all of them writing in an Athenian milieu. There subsequently developed philosophical and polemical examinations of the classical Athenian demagogues in their heyday based on these sources. When events and concepts are systematized, we're in danger of losing sight of their historical context and specificity. They might become modular while at the same time becoming over schematized and be applied thanks to the weight of tradition to situations in which they fail to capture the truth of the matter. Is this what is happening with historical descriptions of Hellenistic demagoguery? A final question goes beyond historiographical representations, insofar as that is possible, to events and more importantly, ideologies on the ground. Did the motivations and actions of leaders and masses in moments of Hellenistic demagoguery owe their form to the classical Athenian example? Were these polis to some degree play acting classical Athenian roles that obscured the true nature of local conditions? This question points to the ongoing debate about the nature of Hellenistic demo democracies to what extent they resemble the ancient demokratia for which we undeniably have the most and best evidence, classical Athens. And Christian Mann has posed this challenge recently uh, in frank terms. 
In this paper, I attempt to address these questions. I offer first a provisional definition of demagoguery, one which I hope picks out a real phenomenon while remaining as objective as possible. I then provide a brief overview of the development of thinking about demagoguery in the classical and early Hellenistic periods. Given time constraints, I turn to a, a single case study by way of a conclusion, juxtaposing some remarks from Plutarch's precepts of statecraft with the Rhodian resistance against the Roman tyrannicide Gaius Cassius Longinus in 42 BCE. The Rhodians had adopted practices of the classical Athenian democracy in the past, but I argue that we should not underestimate specifically local traditions in accounting for the city's actions. I return to Henningborn's account of stasis to suggest that there is perhaps more space than he allows for Hellenistic demagogueries being inspired, inspired from genuine pressure from below. So to begin, what is demagoguery? Obvious to all of us is the fact that strictly speaking, it has a neutral meaning, leading the people. This is how Aristophanes intends the term uh, in its first appearance in the Knights. Uh, it's neutral, it doesn't, uh, it could be practiced by either a good or bad person. And it is perhaps what Thucydides means when he describes the politician uh, Androcles' popularity in Book Eight of his history. I think it's fair to say, however, that by the turn of the fourth century, it was taking on a largely pejorative sense, as at Xenophon's Anabasis 764, where Xenophon himself is accused of it in an episode dating to um, around 400 BCE. In Aristotle's politics, it is purely a form of accusation. This is because critics of democracy were coming to the conclusion that those who rise to prominence in a democratically controlled polis tended to be bad leaders, by their lights anyway. Leaders misled the people rather than led them. Demagoguery was now something that every democratic polis had to be on guard against, lest stasis arise out of demagogic persecution of the wealthy few. This is not to subscribe to the elite's ideas about good governance, but it is, I think, to acknowledge that a certain kind of democratic leadership was more likely on the whole to lead to civil strife, or at least to exacerbate social tensions. In my current research on ancient Greek demagoguery, I've provisionally come up with the following three traits, which individually or in combination suffice to render a politician a demagogue in the context of speaking before an assembly of the demos. They are, first, a rhetorical approach, a kind of populist conceit, which frames politics as a zero-sum game between mass and elite, in which the demos, uh, in which the elite rather, are actively looking to dominate the demos. Second, breaking decorum as the educated elite understood it in the pursuit of pandering to the people in order that they take action of which a majority of the elite disapprove. For example, throwing a festival or more seriously, launching a war. And finally, and most concretely, uh, proposing measures that negatively affected the elite's properties and or their lives, often rather indiscriminately. Again, the, the point is not whether we ourselves approve of such measures or think that they are just, but rather that they were on the whole more likely to lead to stasis. So that's just my working definition. On these grounds then, I think it becomes plausible <clears throat> to turn, return to uh, an example from the uh, early Hellenistic, from early Hellenistic Athens, it becomes plausible that Stratocles of Dynamea was genuinely viewed as a demagogue by many among the elite. Uh, Nino Laraghi has shown how much of our picture of him relies on Plutarch, who might be unduly affected by accusations of demagoguery from old comedy. But in a fragment uh, of Demokaris, the politician and historian, it is said that, quote, one of the Kaloi Kagathoi said Stratocles was mad, minus thy, uh, to propose such degree, to decrees, but Demacaris of Lokonoe said he would have been mad had he not acted mad. As Loragi has pointed out, Demacaris did not necessarily blame Stratocles for his action, in this case proposing effusive honors and privileges for Demetrius Polyorchites. But for a member of the elite, the Kaloi Kagathoi named in the fragment, to accuse a rhetor of madness was a long-standing tradition in the anti-demagogic uh, discourse. And you can see some examples here uh, from Pseudo Xenophon, from Thucydides, from Polybius. I also note that uh, Artemidorus uh, in his Onero Critica uh, says that it was a good sign for a would-be demagogue if he had a dream that he was mad, insane. So this is a, a long-standing trope. Okay, I, I now turn to ancient thinkers' own treatment of this term and whether historians applied it correctly to Hellenistic politics. As stated already, uh, Aristophanes and Thucydides, plus many old comic poets now lost to us or in very scrappy condition, established the pattern for thinking about fifth century Demo Athenian demagogic leadership. 
Many of their descriptions became part of the standard repertoire of a traditional Greek education. Uh, and I note, uh, very, this is a quite striking example. Um, in the fourth century CE, Gregory of Nazianzus could quote Aristophanes' description of a Cleon style demagogue in the Knights in a letter to one of his friends. And the underlying portions here are direct quotations from um, Aristophanes' Knights, line 218. Uh, we tend at a very general level to confine our analysis of demagoguery to the later fifth century. But I would note the comment of the Aristotelian Athenion Politeia. Since the time of Cleophon, leadership of the people, demagogia, has now been handed down successfully among those most willing to be audacious and to pander to the majority with an eye to present circumstances. The author conceives of the roughly 100 year span between the later fifth century and his own day as a continuous string of demagogues. Outside of historiography, the figures began to be systematically analyzed in the works of philosophers. First Plato, although interestingly note that he never actually uses the term demagogue, and then especially Aristotle, although Theopompus of Chios also deserves credit for his unremittingly hostile excursus on Athenian demagogues from Book 10 of the Philippica. The philosophical schools continued this legacy. Antisthenes the Socratic had already railed against Athenian demagogues in a treatise on statesmanship in the earlier fourth century, but Demetrius of Phalerum in particular continued Aristotle's task. As you might be aware, uh, he wrote an entire treatise on Cleon, the title of which can be read in this Hellenistic inscription from Rhodes, listing the contents of a library collection. This is an image we've already seen uh, during our conference, which uh, Manuela Mari brought up during her talk. The historian and Epicurean Idomeneus of Lampsacus likewise wrote a hostile pamphlet on Athenian demagogues. As you can probably tell, what unites these works is their antagonism towards demagoguery, even towards the Athenian democracy as a whole. Um, a composite picture emerges. Demagogues are often accused of being supposititious citizens with parents of servile status. It's worth noting that as far as we can tell, this sort of accusation tapers off during the Hellenistic period, although it returns with a vengeance with Posidonius's depiction of Athenian, which I mentioned before. Nothing the Athenian demagogues do, according to the sources that I've reviewed, is free of the taint of corruption, pandering, or self-enrichment. They also all left the Athenian demos worse than they found them, a charge that had already been lodged by Plato in the Gorgias. Even Eubulus, a fourth century politician most contemporary historians would probably label a moderate Democrat, is castigated by Theopompus for having rendered the Athenian people weaker and more easygoing through his distributions of the Theoric Fund. This is a good reminder that for the most hostile ancient critics of democracy, all leadership would inevitably be bad, both because it attracted the worst types of people and because no one was capable of standing up to the mob. Overall then, the literature on demagoguery from the classical and early Hellenistic period with its obvious political tendency does not look like the most promising start for establishing the historical truth about these figures, about those figures that are labeled demagogues. But another problem more important for us is that this literature is so overwhelmingly Athenocentric. For many later Greek authors, demagoguery clearly must have meant first and foremost, the sort of political leadership exhibited by Cleon and those of his ilk in classical Athens. So we in the present are forced to correct both for the biased picture of demagogues and for the influence, perhaps undue, that these sources exerted on Hellenistic authors. Because there's a danger that much of what we read is only so much recycling of classical Athenian topoi. Now I should point out that there is in fact a classical era source that suggests that what we are looking at is not simply the influence of Athens all the way down. Uh, and that is Aristotle himself. The historical books of the politics, books four through six, based on the research conducted by Aristotle's pupils on 158 individual city-states, reveal to us numerous instances of classical demagoguery and elite reaction that seem to operate according to a broadly shared logic, not one exclusive to or even originating from the Athenian example. Arguably, the trends Aristotle sees during his own time extend into the early Hellenistic period at least, and if I may be permitted to cite my own work, which Ben Gray was kind enough to mention, I've recently argued that a dossier of inscriptions from early Hellenistic telos dealing with stasis and re reconciliation can be expl explicated in large part by recourse to an Aristotelian analysis of demagoguery and oligarchic reaction. Thus, while Aristotle's school is primarily responsible for the classical and Athenocentric focus of our picture of demagoguery, he might still be a worthwhile guide to early Hellenistic city politics, as P.F. Frelick has recently re-emphasized uh, following Philippe Gautier. <clears throat> 
Now, I can't hope to provide sufficient answers to all of the concept conceptual and historiographical questions I've raised here, but I want to use the final half of my talk to re-examine a particular case that suggests some ways forward. A single incident can't serve as a rule, of course, but it can at least establish that not every instance of Hellenistic demagoguery was an historical illusion, uh, a historic, historiographical illusion rather, or a case of pure Athens mimicry. I do wanna pause for a second though to consider the notion of Hellenistic city-states dependence on an, a prior Athenian model, one of the topics of our conference and to suggest some nuances. First, there's the somewhat pejorative connotation involved in thinking of this process as the conscious intentional adoption of the Athenian democratic model as though classical Athens steps in to play a role that the smaller polis themselves are incapable of fulfilling. I think it's worth bearing in mind that such processes of adaptation often occur subconsciously or by habit without any plan in advance. We're often unaware of the deep roots of our actions, but we cannot escape them. As John Maynard Keynes said, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. But adaptations of pre-existing models are also, of course, more than simple acts of imitation. They are creative exercises in identity formation and action that produce something new. To cite an economic thinker quite different from Keynes, quote, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Now, many of you will recognize uh, Marx's famous statement from the 18th Brumaire, but I want to highlight what he uh, says subsequently, quote, just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before, precisely in such epochs of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service, borrowing from them names, battle slogans, and costumes in order to present this new scene in world history in time-honored disguise and borrowed language. Now, I dwell on the language of theatricality here because it's relevant to the text that I'm going to use to introduce my case study, and that's Plutarch's Precepts of Statecraft. This work, along with the same author's treatise on whether old men should participate in politics, constitutes one of our best sources for the civic life of the Greek polis in the early imperial period, and historians like Henri Farnu have wrung much out of it regarding popular politics in the early second century CE. This postdates our period, of course, but as we will see, Plutarch knows of examples of what appear to be demagoguery from his own day, and he would have been aware of examples from the later Hellenistic period, including the one that I will discuss. As I've mentioned, the Chironian writer several times uses the theater as his metaphorical frame for thinking about effective statesmanship. You all will probably be aware of his famous remark in this treatise that as a politician, you should quote, arrange your cloak more carefully and from the office of the generals, keep your eyes upon the orator's platform and not have great pride of confidence in your crown since you see the boots of Roman soldiers just above your head. He then immediately though follows up with a theatrical image. No, you should imitate the actors who while putting into the performance their own passion, character and reputation, yet listen to the prompter and do not go beyond the, liberty, the degree of liberty in rhythms and meters permitted by those in authority over them. For to fail in one's part in public life brings not mere hissing or catcalls or stamping of feet, but many have experienced the dread chastiser, axes that cleave the neck, as did your countryman Pardalas and his followers when they forgot their proper limitations. So the presence of the Roman imperial authority ought to lead Greek statesmen to recognize their limits and act only such parts appropriate to them. The addressee of the dialogue, Menimicus of Sardis, is supposed to see in his doomed fellow, uh, fellow citizen Pardalas an example of a politician who did not heed this advice. Unfortunately, we know almost nothing more about this instance of stasis, although Plutarch brings it up again at the conclusion of the dialogue, where we learn that Pardalas engaged in stasis with uh, his fellow civic elite, a man named Tyrannus. Uh, the stasis appears to have brought the weight of the Roman boot down on Sardis, but inscriptions at least conform confirm for us that Pardalus was from a very powerful family in Sardis. What might Pardalus have done? Plutarch gives us some hints in the immediately following sections. He says that while children dressing up in their father's clothes prompt laughter, <clears throat> what we might call demagoguery is no joke. He says, quote, the officials in the cities, when they foolishly urge the people to imitate the deeds, ideals, and actions of their ancestors, 
however unsuitable they may be for the present times and conditions, stir up the common folk. And though what they do is laughable, what is done to them is no laughing matter. Plutarch continues that the times call for less volatile objects of imitation, or mimesis, like the Athenian amnesty of 403 BCE, which Ben Gray has just discussed. And in fact, he cited uh, this treatise. Um, and then, but Plutarch continues, but Marathon, the Eurymedon, Plataea, and all the other examples which make the common folk vainly to swell with pride and kick up their heels should be left to the schools of the sophists. I suggest there's a strong chance here that Partalas played the demagogue in Sardis along these lines, playing on local pride among the common people in a way that ultimately looks seditious to the Romans. We might compare once more the actions of Athenion at Athens as reported by Posidonius, but I can do no more than mention the connection in passing here. I note again the strongly theatrical or at least mimetic flavor of the Plutarch passage, but also the focus on memory and historical paradigms. Excessive demagoguery, according to Plutarch, was during his time likely to originate from a misplaced sense of nostalgia, from remembering the great deeds of one's ancestors and attempting to match them. Plutarch uses Athenian examples because they are the most famous, uh, but of course, in a local context, a rhetor would draw upon relevant local traditions. A member of the elite from Sardis would not bother speaking of Marathon to a Sardian audience, uh, but there might have been other local paradigmata from which to choose. In any case, we know that Sardians of the early imperial period were intensely interested in and proud of their local history, both Greek and Lydian. And I would direct you to uh, Peter Toneman's recent fascinating article about this, about a recently published um, inscribed local history of Sardis. So with this in mind, let's turn finally to my chief example, the Rhodians act of resistance against the tyrannicide Cassius in 42 BCE during the Roman civil wars. Appian is our main source for the episode. Cassius had settled on a policy of destroying Rhodes and Lycia since they favored his opponents, Antony Octavian and Octavian, despite the fact that Cassius had received an education on Rhodes itself. While Cassius trained his naval forces at nearby Mendes in Caria, the Rhodians reacted to the news. This is a crucial, crucial passage. Of the Rhodians, those who were more reputable, more in Logoi, um, were afraid since they were about to come into conflict with Romans. But the people, the Leos, had an arrogant attitude a megalophroneto, since they remembered ancient deeds, palaia erga, against men of a very different sort. The opposition between the wise few and the impetuous masses during democratic decision making here can be replicated over and over again in Athenian sources. Um, so, uh, just some examples here, I won't dwell on them, but you know, from the late fifth century, the old oligarch. Uh, through the uh, Oxyrhynchus historian's description of the Demionetus affair in Athens, uh, through down to uh, the, the lead up to the Lamian War in the early Hellenistic period, you get this division between the wise few amongst whom there is the least uh, licentiousness um, and those who are you know, proper and, and are the, the property holders uh, between them and the Deimos who attempts to, you know, is warlike and um, ignorant. Um, so is this just an imposition of that potentially distorting historiographical framework on the Rhodian situation? I very much doubt it. We have just seen that Plutarch warns explicitly against just this sort of demagogic nostalgia, which was likely to lead communities into ruin. And Appian continues the narrative. When Cassius rejected peace overtures uh, from the Rhodians, the right-thinking Rhodians, those uh, Aophromuntes, became even more afraid, but Alexandros and Nasaeus played the demagogue uh, to the masses, the plethos, reminding them that Mithridates had sailed against Rhodes with a greater number of ships, as well as Demetrius on an occasion earlier still than Mithridates. And I note here that uh, Gian Paolo Urso has recently um, published an article in which he shows the changing meaning of demagogia in imperial writers, but uh, he admits that this is, this is uh, an old sense of the term in the sense of riling up the masses. So it, it definitely has that sense here with the opposition between right thinking Rhodians and the mass. Uh, so here then are Rhodes own Marathon and Plataea in the form of Demetrius and Mithridates 
The patriotic paradigmata through which a skilled rhetor could induce the masses to undertake an endeavor disapproved of by the elite. The scenario fits Plutarch's description in the precepts almost perfectly and with the same terrible results. The Rhodians were quickly defeated at sea, 50 ringleaders were rounded up and executed, and Cassius stripped the city of most of its public and private wealth. Although this might look to us as though it was inevitable in hindsight, Alexandros and Nasaeus had managed to convince the Rhodians in the moment that they had a fighting chance. The memory of their past glories against Mithridates and Demetrius had made the people arrogant, as Appian or Historus editorializes. We know that many of these memories would have come from monumental objects, honors in stone that commemorated the heroes of past ages. Diodorus tells us, for example, that during the siege of the city by Demetrius Polyarchites, the Rhodians had voted that the bodies of the war dead were to be buried at public expense, and that the parents and children of the dead be reared with support from the public treasury. Uh, note also that when um, the war orphans came of age, they were uh, to be honored with a panoply at, in the theater at the Dionysia, tying into something um, Paolo, uh, Paolo uh, Ciccarelli uh, brought to our attention before. Um, I, I note that uh, not only did they pledge to do this, but the Rhodians actually carried out these honors, and I'm sure there would have been uh, permanent monuments in stone to these heroes. Uh, this, of course, looks like Athenian practice beginning in the fifth century BCE, the so-called Patrios Nomos. We know now, thanks to inscriptions, that the Thasians of the fourth century adopted this practice too, and um, see Fournier and Amon on this, uh, these important inscriptions. Was it direct borrowing from Athens, though? Uh, I note that the rhetoric to Alexander, uh, ascribed to Aerosol, but probably by uh, Anaximenes of Lampsacus, suggests that public burial for the war dead and the rearing of war orphans was characteristic of any good democracy uh, without singling out Athens. Perhaps we have simply lost evidence of this from elsewhere. If we are to speak of Athenian influence on first century BCE roads, then it's of, at best, a secondary or tertiary order. The city had its own proud history to recall, preserved, as I mentioned, through monuments. Um, so in addition to these honors that Diodorus describes, um, bearing upon the, the situation with Demetrius Polyarchites, we also know of other monuments. So in 2013, uh, Vasa Kondorini published a series of Hellenistic inscriptions for the Rhodian war dead, including an engraved, engraved statue base that honors one Astyanax, son of Astymedes, for dying while, quote, struggling on behalf of the Deimos, uh, in the course of which he became a good man, an Aner Agathos. Um, now, historians and epigraphers are well aware that such, pa such patriotic inscriptions might populate the civic landscape of a major or even minor polis. And uh, Florian Forster has brought this to our attention in his book on decrees for cities own citizens. Uh, what we may have paid less attention to is the um, long-term reception of these monuments and their ability to play a role uh, in political situations such as the one at Rhodes uh, under discussion here. Uh, even if a city's democratic credentials had declined during the later Hellenistic period, as they almost certainly had in Rhodes, if it had been uh, a democracy ever at all, these monuments had been created for an inspirational civic purpose, and they could be reactivated again in ways that bucked the preferences of the civic elite. In other words, I suspect that this democratic infrastructure, so to speak, though lying around largely obsolete and crumbling in many places, could be utilized on occasion in traditional and quite genuine demagogic ways. In conclusion, I would like to return to Henning Borm's monumental recent analysis of Hellenistic stasis. Borm deals with this Rhodian example we've just examined, uh, but mainly as an instance of what he sees as the underlying cause behind stasis rivalry among members of the elite. He does not deny, of course, that Alexandros and Naseas were able to persuade the popular assembly to follow their suggestion against the re recommendation of those more reputable Rhodians who wanted to maintain peace with Cassius. But the power of the crowd as an independent force recedes to the background in his picture, if not outright disappears. In a more generalizing section of analysis, he writes, quote, hence the economically disadvantaged classes form presumably the reservoir in which members of the elite could possibly woo supporters in the fight against their rivals by appealing to what he calls appropriate reflexes. And this is uh, my translation of his work. And he compares the actions of men like Alexandros and Naseas 
to those Roman nobiles who used popularis methods around the same time in the first century BCE. I think this position underestimates the power of the average Greek demos. The populus Romanus could be addressed at cantiones and their mood gauged accordingly. But Roman crowds did not influence the subject, the substance of legislation at the moment of voting. Greek popular audiences did. In many instances, they probably came with preconceived notions, prejudices, and preferences, which they attempted to convey to the rhetors through thorobos and other communicative methods, which elites could ignore only at their peril. In other words, there was always a possibility that even an elite fairly united around policy would not be able to dictate the agenda. And, and politicians from among the elite would break with their peers in order to gain an authority and prestige by giving voice to the people's wishes. In Born's picture, the demos typically does not support a measure until it is brought to their attention by enterprising elites who are attempting to gain a leg up on their rivals with whom they are already, um, sorry, with whom they are already in competition. What I'm suggesting is that the dynamics of a typical Greek popular assembly meant that pressure from below could in fact have been much stronger than this picture allows. Consider again, Diodorus's description of the assembly in 323 um, that led to the Lamian War. Um, he describes the popular leaders there as quote, giving a body, somata poiontex, to the impulses of the common people in framing their decree. This striking metaphor comes from the world of art, where sculptors and painters give bodily existence to a figure by representing it in an artistic medium. Now, the process of forming of political will, of representing the vox populi, is more complicated than this, as I hope to show in forthcoming work. Nevertheless, it involves demonic inclinations over which the elite cannot hope to exert complete control, so long as deliberation occurs in a popular assembly and not in camera, exclusively among elites. I believe that such pre-existing popular attitudes were likely at play in the situation at Rhodes, and that it was not entirely up to Alexandros and Narcaeus to activate the Demos's nostalgic memory of past events. This collective memory was part of a broader Rhodian popular culture of histories and monuments that the elite did not shape alone. If that picture holds for the, the Hellenistic Greek world more broadly, then it's no, no wonder that the Greek cities, call them democracies or not, periodically produce populist measures in the face of elite resistance. In other words, demagoguery. Thank you very much.